Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Scott Dodson, Jeffrey C. Hazard, Jr., Distinguished Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research at University of California Hastings College of the Law. We will discuss his article, Beyond Bias in Diversity Jurisdiction, which will be published in the Duke Law Journal. So welcome to the podcast, Scott. Thank you very much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. So as a recovering civil procedure professor, I really enjoyed reading your paper because it grappled with a lot of things about diversity jurisdiction that have been bothering me for years. And I'm really excited to to share this with whatever fraction of the listening audience is as excited as I am. And obviously you are about civil procedure related issues. And, And so I was wondering if you could kind of just begin by just in a nutshell, telling people who may not know or who may have forgotten, what exactly is diversity jurisdiction? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, we we live in a nation that has states and the federal government, and both of those sovereigns have their own court systems. So Texas uh, has its own Texas state courts, uh, but it also has federal courts within its borders that are beholden to the federal government. And diversity jurisdiction is one species of federal jurisdiction that authorizes the federal courts, wherever they may may be located, to hear certain kinds of cases. Now, diversity jurisdiction authorizes federal courts to hear cases that state courts also could hear. And so the question basically is, do we want these kinds of cases to be heard by state courts, or do we want them to be heard by federal courts? Diversity jurisdiction authorizes federal courts to hear a certain class of cases. These are cases that are between citizens of different states. Okay, so where did it come from? How long have we had it? And what was the reason for adopting diversity jurisdiction in in the first place? And of course, the last question is, I think, even historically a little contested. So maybe, you know, if you could talk a little bit about sort of different reasons people gave for thinking that this was a good idea. Yeah, sure. So diversity jurisdiction is authorized in the Constitution. Um, so it's been around for, well, as long as the Constitution has been. Um, and it was, um, it was part of the original drafting and the phrasing in the constitution is just authorizing diversity jurisdiction when a controversy is between citizens of different states. And, um, the drafters of the constitution really didn't have, um, or at least there isn't a lot of historical record about what their motivations were. Uh, But the ratification debates really sort of brought this into the fore. And the people who were opposed to the Constitution really didn't like the diversity clause. The diversity clause is the clause in the Constitution that extends diversity jurisdiction. And uh, people like Patrick Henry and George Mason in Virginia, they all attacked diversity jurisdiction vehemently because they worried that diversity jurisdiction would essentially destroy the state courts by giving all these cases to the federal courts instead of the state courts, that the state courts would essentially have nothing to do and would cease to exist. And so being good states' rightsists, they didn't really like uh, the idea of diversity jurisdiction. And they pointed out a few, um, uh, rightly so, a few reasons why a diversity jurisdiction might actually be a problem. So state courts are sort of peppered all throughout all the states, whereas federal courts are fewer and farther between. And so litigants who might have to um, resolve their dispute in a federal court might have to travel quite a ways in order to do so, whereas uh, a state court might be right next door. And so there were some additional costs involved. The people who really wanted diversity jurisdiction at the time were the federalists, and they defended the grant 
of diversity jurisdiction on what I call the bias rationale. These were people like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall and James Wilson. Uh, they were staunch defenders of the Constitution. So they were going to be staunch defenders of diversity jurisdiction too. Uh, and they defended it based on the idea that there ought to be a neutral forum, a neutral federal forum for resolving disputes between citizens of different states because they feared that the state court might be biased in favor of an in-state litigant and against an out-of-state litigant. Now, they defended diversity jurisdiction on these grounds, but they defended it kind of tepidly. And they were highly deferential to the state courts, and they didn't mean to impugn the integrity of the state courts. Um, so they defended it tepidly, but they still adhered to that bias rationale in defending it that way. And so diversity jurisdiction was ultimately enacted as part of the Constitution or enshrined in the Constitution. And it sort of carried that policy, that bias rationale with it ever since. So, so that was a, a part of your paper that I thought was, was really interesting because I, I didn't realize that the sort of federalist defense of diversity jurisdiction was kind of so diffident in the moment. And it, it seems oddly kind of inconsistent with the fact that diversity jurisdiction seems to have been so important in the early history of the federal courts and also in sort of the really early history of some of the cases that came before the Supreme Court. And I'm, I'm thinking in, in particular of like cases like Ware v. Hilton about, um, you know, the sequestration clauses and whatnot. And this sense that like foreign creditors and especially like English and Scottish creditors weren't going to get a fair shake in United States courts. Right. And so div the diversity clause includes both domestic diversity jurisdiction, so citizens between different citizens from different states, and also alienage jurisdiction, which is a dispute between a US citizen and a foreign national. And of course, creditor debtor relations uh, were a huge issue in the early republic. They had a huge economic, social and political issue, frankly. Um, and it just happened that many of those creditor debtor relationships were interstate or sometimes, you know, um, um, so, uh, sometimes, you know, national, uh, international. And so um, it's, it's no surprise that that creditor debtor, creditor debtor relationship and the importance of it became a part of diversity jurisdiction too. Um, some have theorized that that was the main reason for the federalists uh, to defend diversity jurisdiction is that they wanted a forum that would uh, tend to the needs of creditors, including foreign creditors. And they thought that the courts of the national government would be more sensitive to those creditor needs than the courts of state governments uh, when they were likely to be resolving disputes involving in-state debtors. Indeed. And, and it seems to me, I mean, like one of the odd things about federal jurisdiction is that I, I think today it's sort of so easy to colloquially think of it as sort of federal courts deciding national federal law related questions. But actually the kind of federal question jurisdiction wasn't created f for a long time after diversity jurisdiction was. And as you point out in your paper, it was such an important part of what the federal courts were doing for a long period of time, you know, to what extent do you think that this sort of bias rationale, both kind of out of state bias or sort of foreign citizen bias was really salient and meaningful in the early Republic, as opposed to um, sort of changes in the role of the federal judiciary throughout American history as sort of America's role 
and the kind of national consciousness developed over time. Right. So um, the the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists sort of reached this compromise in the ratification debates where uh, they agreed that the diversity clause wouldn't extend diversity jurisdiction to the federal courts as a matter of course, but rather they sort of leave it up to Congress to do so. And so that pacified uh, people like Mason a little bit, at least, uh, to, to, to think that there might be hope that Congress wouldn't give the federal courts diversity jurisdiction right away. But that didn't happen. And the first Judiciary Act, the first Congress, extended diversity jurisdiction to the federal courts in 1789. And it became a huge part of the lower federal court dockets. Because as you said, there wasn't federal question jurisdiction, which is the other major basis of federal jurisdiction until 1875. For almost 100 years, the main business of the lower federal courts was adjudicating diversity jurisdiction disputes. Um, Now, there was also evidence that it didn't destroy the state courts by any stretch of the imagination. There were still plenty of cases that the state courts continued to hear, even with the grant of diversity jurisdiction being given to the lower federal courts at the early stage. Um, of the country. Uh, And the evidence that we have about whether the bias rationale was really the motivating factor um, or whether the diversity jurisdiction did any work in alleviating any kind of bias, the empirical evidence that we have of what happened in the early stage of the republic is, is almost non-existent. Mm. So we don't have a lot of evidence um, of how diversity jurisdiction was working in terms of the bias rationale back then. We do have the Supreme Court's continued invocation of the bias rationale, um, however. And so even from the Marshall Court in the early 1800s, the court repeatedly adhered to the bias rationale in its interpretation of the grant of diversity jurisdiction. And that's really where the bias rationale became entrenched, is in the court opinions. I mean, it's certainly my sense that, historically speaking, there was an evolution, a kind of ideological evolution from the concept of a nation composed of discrete like independently sovereign states to a nation with states subsumed within it. Uh, I mean, to what extent do you think that that shift to the extent that, and as it happened might have affected the sort of salience and legitimacy of sort of the original conception of the bias rationale that you discuss? Yeah. I mean, I think the bias rationale had a lot of, um, So I I think the Federalists were legitimately concerned um, that lodging interstate disputes in state courts could be detrimental to national identity and sort of the national expansion of commerce. Um, It was particularly important for commercial relationships in, um, in the late 1800s. And after the Civil War, when um, when the federal government became much more powerful, I think that there was a renewed push to um, scale back diversity jurisdiction, in particular because I think a lot of the progressives of the progressive era thought that the federal courts were unfairly advantaging business interests and corporate interests uh, over individuals, and that diversity jurisdiction was being gained uh, by those particular parties. So it has had a very interesting and sort of tortured history over time as, um, as, as different political blocks have either contested diversity jurisdiction or supported it for, ver- for a variety of reasons. In the backdrop, there's always this historical understanding that it was the diversity jurisdiction is meant for the bias rationale, even if the times have changed and other considerations are more pressing. And this was something that 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 really struck me, and I like the way that you sort of 
dealt with the or sort of framed the scholarship on the subject because it it really did seem to me that sort of like in a sense like in a historical sense like bias is like almost in the eye of the beholder like like what you mean by bias might depend on the particular historical moment and the person who's or the entity who's invoking the concept. And in particular, I was thinking of kind of some of Ed Purcell's discussions of sort of the ideological or kind of socio-historical meaning of our use of diversity jurisdiction and sort of how it became seen as a, a kind of corporate versus individual sort of like whose interests are we going to prioritize which which you talk about to some degree in in your paper um like like to what extent is bias a kind of historically embedded concept when we think about diversity jurisdiction Purcell's the standard bearer on the, on diversity jurisdiction especially in the eras in which he uh has studied it and He's exactly right. I mean, in that in that era of the rise of corporations, the prominence of corporations, um, corporations were a repeat litigator with relatively um, uniform interests in how the law developed and in how courts saw particular parties and their importance. And the corporates, the corporate. Um, interests and um, corporations individually tended to favor diversity jurisdiction, not because of any um, out-of-state bias or in-state bias, but rather because of a corporate bias. Um, and it was a bias not against corporations in state court as much as it was a bias in favor of corporations in federal court. And uh, that is a fascinating history that's um, uh, he makes a very persuasive argument about it, and it really helps illuminate the role that diversity jurisdiction has played over time. It plays a role in my paper just because it's important to recognize that the out-of-state bias rationale has really morphed in different ways towards something that is not an out-of-state bias uh, lodestar, but rather it could be a bias in, uh, uh, based on other kinds of status. It could be a bias of anti-rural. Uh, it could be an anti-rural bias or an anti-urban bias, or it could be a political bias. And you can imagine that you know, Planned Parenthood might really dislike the idea of being a um, defendant in rural Texas um, or rural Oklahoma, but not necessarily because it's an out-of-state corporation rather because mm -hmm. of far more salient factors to modern society. And, and indeed, and it, it struck me that, so you, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're critical of the sort of practical meaningfulness of the bi bias rationale in thinking about what we want the uh, diversity jurisdiction docket to accomplish today and sort of the debate over, you know, what it should look like and what the kind of rationale for diversity jurisdiction ought to be. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about why you think that the sort of traditional bias rationale for diversity jurisdiction is no longer, um, compelling and sort of why we ought to think about it differently. Sure. So I think that there are a number. Of, so you're right. I, I stake out the position that the bias rationale alone is woefully insufficient to justify diversity jurisdiction today. And there's really, I go through five reasons. One is the first is that like even um, even the perception of out-of-state bias really doesn't exist on a 
on a wide scale. It, it, there is some evidence, survey evidence of attorneys suggests the perception of out-of-state bias of state courts in some isolated pockets that tend to be concentrated in the South. Um, but it's, it's localized and it's fairly sporadic and it can't, um, it doesn't provide evidence that there is widespread um, perception of out-of-state bias in state courts. So that's one reason. The, a second reason is that even where there is a perception of out-of-state bias, it doesn't seem to be a particularly strong motivating factor in avoiding state courts and invoking diversity jurisdiction. In fact, there was a study that showed that of the cases that are filed in federal court on the basis of diversity jurisdiction, about half of them are filed by in-state plaintiffs who, who ought to have no fear of out-of-state bias in state courts. They, they ought to prefer state courts if there were out-of-state bias in state courts. Uh, and um, of the survey evidence, the, uh, the numbers of uh, the percentages of attorneys who say that uh, fear of out-of-state bias is a motivating factor in selecting federal court is very small. It's like 12% uh, or something like that. It turns out that there are many other factors that attorneys care much more about when invoking federal jurisdiction. It could be you know, the familiarity of the procedures involved in federal court. It could be the convenience of federal court. Uh, it could be the inconvenience of federal court to the other party. Um, there are lots, it could be other kinds of biases like anti-corporate biases or things like that, but there are lots of other uh, reasons why attorneys will invoke diversity jurisdiction that have just nothing to do with out-of-state bias, even when they perceive that there might be out-of-state bias. Yeah, it was it, as an IP person, it really struck me that like one of the most kind of high profile examples of court bias in recent years is actually a federal court, you know, the Eastern District of Texas, known for its, I'll, I'll say, perceived bias against patent defendants, right? It's sort of like, if the concern is, you know, preventing bias, it doesn't seem like uh, diversity jurisdiction worked particularly well, or rather federal courts were particularly effective at preventing bias in, in cases like that one. So one wonders like to what extent the kind of the structural state federal distinction is really all that relevant to that particular issue, given this sort of much more kind of national consciousness that we have today. Well, that's right. And, and so even when there is some perception of out-of-state bias, and that would motivate um, a party to avoid state court, there's no guarantee that federal court will be any more neutral um, on that on that score. I mean, federal judges often come from the same political or social circles as state judges do, and some were even former state judges. Um, and so there are examples of federal courts being, um, you know, biased in similar kinds of ways as state courts. And so the idea that diversity jurisdiction provides a neutrality is itself a questionable uh, proposition. So one of the things I – or rather, the core thing that I think is really interesting about your paper is that you suggest that you know even in the absence of an out-of-state bias rationale, there are still reasons to think that jury, jur, the diversity jurisdiction can do kind of efficient and useful things. Um, so maybe, you know, could you talk a little bit about sort of why you think diversity jurisdiction is still a good idea, even if we don't think that the problem that it was arguably designed to solve is really a problem we need to worry about anymore? Yeah. So the, the main, the main thrust of the, of the paper is to try to shift away from, 
the bias rationale as the focal point of debates about diversity jurisdiction. And that we, we really ought to, I mean, diversity jurisdiction undeniably has costs and those are substantial. Um, it's, it's the lodging in federal court of a case involving a state law claim, which deprives the state courts of their authority to adjudicate those kinds of claims. And, um, it distracts federal courts from the uh, federal question cases that they might need to devote their resources to and which are properly in federal court. Diversity jurisdiction has all kinds of other ancillary doctrines that create uh, logistical costs like eerie questions or joinder issues or abstention doctrines. Um, and so uh, diversity jur jur jurisdiction undeniably has costs and it makes up 30 to 40 percent of the federal docket um, so there might be really good reasons to scale it back but i just think that we ought to have that conversation about those costs being balanced against other benefits besides alleviation of out-of-state bias and some of those benefits include the alleviation of other kinds of biases or the benefits of procedural uniformity because the procedure is the same in federal court no matter where you are, or the ability to transfer the case from one federal court to another federal court across state lines when doing so would be to the convenience of the parties. So those, I think, are salutary benefits of diversity jurisdiction that ought to play a stronger role in the debate. The biggest one, and the one that I try to focus on in the paper a little bit more than the others, is the ability to aggregate um, cases, claims or cases. And multi-state aggregation has some great benefits to it. There are efficiency benefits because if you have claims that involve the same basic dispute and the same facts and the same and similar parties, then litigating them together is largely better for everyone and the system. Um, it's also fairer because then you don't have different courts reaching different uh, conclusions about what happened or what the liability is or what the damages should be. Instead, you have just the same court doing it all. And uh, diversity jurisdiction, because it would enable consolidation in a federal court, might, um, uh, might be able to facilitate aggregation in a way that can't be done in state court because state courts are limited by their own borders. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, and I, and I have to say, I mean, I found the sort of class and aggregation based efficiency arguments that you made really compelling on sort of a practical standpoint. I mean, it just makes so much more sense. And it's, it seems like in fact, how people actually want, to litigate these kinds of kind of multi-state, multi-party uh, litigations. I, I also wondered about like expertise of the courts and maybe even like dialogue between federal and state courts about some of these, these questions. I mean, in the sense that like, you know, as you, as you point out in your paper, like, Federal decisions on state law in under their diversity jurisdiction aren't precedential, but it, it seems like at least state courts like pay attention to them and that there's sort of a back and forth between the two courts. And, and I can't help but wonder whether there might not be some value there as well. Yeah, I think there is. Um, you know, Bob Shapiro at Emory has written quite a bit about sort of dialogic federalism and the idea is that having different courts um, interject or voice opinions on particular areas of the law just enhances the richness of the law and, and perhaps leads to better decision making overall. And there is some argument that diversity jurisdiction uh, can play a role in that salutary process. I do think that supplemental jurisdiction, which does isn't going away, which is the joinder of a state claim along with a federal claim in federal court, that also gives federal courts the ability to offer their voice on issues of state law. 
Um, but diversity jurisdiction undoubtedly expands that voice. Uh, one of the big issues is just whether it's expanding in a way that um, you know you may maybe you get diminished um, utility from an expanded voice. I I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly a, a an argument. So one of the things I thought was maybe potentially controversial in your article was I got the sense that in some ways you're. So- you, you might even be advocating a sort of liberalization of diversity jurisdiction in in some circumstances, which seems to push back against the idea that you suggest elsewhere of like m- certain factions, political factions moving to cabinet to some degree. So what do you see as the benefits of liberalization and where do you think that that would be most productive? Yeah. So I think that, um, that, that my paper would be useful for restraining diversity jurisdiction in some contexts, especially those in which the costs of diversity jurisdiction are quite high and the benefits that I've identified are just super low. And, but it might justify expanding diversity jurisdiction in other contexts. And one, an easy one to think about is just facilitating multi-district litigation. So multi-district litigation is a phenomenon of federal court. It's the ability to take a whole bunch of cases from across the country. They all have to be in federal court, but then consolidate them into one court. And MDL, that's the acronym, has really kind of taken off in in recent years, especially with mm-hmm. medical device um, or pharmaceutical cases, in which uh, consumers from all over the country are affected in approximately the same way. They all sue essentially, essentially the same defendant. And if they can all get into federal court, then they all can join their cases together, consolidate their cases together before a single judge and have all the economies of scale and efficiencies that come with aggregating those issues into one. But if you think about the poor plaintiff who happens to be suing Pfizer um, in Delaware, and uh, because the plaintiff is in Delaware, and I I don't know if Pfizer is incorporated in Delaware, but I assume Pfizer is, (laughs) <laughs> um, and, and that and that case uh, can't be heard in federal court. Um, if that plaintiff could be maybe uh, joined with another plaintiff from out of state, uh, then uh, you know maybe minimal diversity because that presence of that out of state citizen might enable that case to be filed in federal court, or if it's filed in state court, it might enable the defendant Pfizer to remove that case to federal court so that it can be consult simply for the purposes of it being consolidated with the, uh, all of the other cases, similar cases that are pending from around the country um, in one MDL. Um, it would just, it's just a shame that some individual cases can't be brought or taken to federal court and thereby consolidated with the MDL simply because of limits on diversity jurisdiction. So I think that you know thinking about the value of aggregation might be a good way to think about reforming diversity jurisdiction in certain ways so that we could allow those aggregation benefits to inure to those uh, cases that otherwise wouldn't be able to take advantage of them simply because they are in a particular state. Yeah. So Scott... It- in closing, one of the one of the other things that struck me about your paper, which had honestly I had no idea that this was the case, was like how frequently diversity jurisdiction has been the subject of proposed legislation in Congress in ways that seem like they were largely unsuccessful in getting passed and that there was limited sort of dialogue in terms of what was trying to be accomplished. And to what extent do you think that this alternative frame for talking about what we want diversity jurisdiction to accomplish might help 
uh, generate a more productive kind of legislative conversation? Yeah. So um, because the debate about diversity jurisdiction has been so robust, there have naturally been proposals um, in Congress to limit it, mostly to limit it. Uh, and those proposals have almost uniformly failed um, in Congress. I think partly that's because there's a strong corporate lobby that still likes diversity jurisdiction, and um, it's easier to kill bills than to see them passed. Uh, but there have been a few instances in which diversity bills have passed, and they have they have actually tended to expand diversity jurisdiction. So one of the most infamous is the Class Action Fairness Act of 2005, in which Congress uh, passed a passed a bill that expanded diversity jurisdiction over certain kinds of class actions. And the interesting thing about that particular moment in history was that the that everyone pretty much knew that that CAFA, as it's called, was uh, to give defendants and particularly corporate defendants, um, an advantage. It wasn't to give out-of-state defendants an advantage. It was to give corporate defendants an advantage and all defendants an advantage by making uh, diversity jurisdiction minimal diversity for these certain kinds of class actions. And um, nevertheless, the proponents of CAFA and a lot of the legislative history still tries to adhere to the bias rationale of diversity jurisdiction when it just really isn't about any kind of state court bias against out-of-state uh, uh, parties. So my hope is that the paper, by encouraging debaters to move away from the bias rationale, will in fact free the debate to be on its own merits. You, you can debate CAFA, and there a lot of peop many people have, and there are strong opinions on both sides. But CAFA really should be debated on the purpose that it was really put forward for, which was to privilege uh, certain parties in certain class actions, regardless of their in-state or out-of-state status. And I just think that having a more honest debate about that uh, would be better for both legislation going forward and for interpretation of that legislation once it's passed. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really illuminating uh, discussion for me of, of diversity jurisdiction. It was a real pleasure, Brian. Hello, this is Beverly Garland. The Federal Trade Commission asks you to look beyond the smiling faces and super promises because the FTC knows that some advertising can be misleading and deceptive. So don't believe everything you see or hear. Beware of extravagant promises and unsupported claims. Check it out before you buy. Shop wisely, you'll save money. This message is brought to you by the Federal Trade Commission, Washington, D.C.